Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 45. Today we are here with a very special guest, Peter McPherson. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yes, yeah. Good. I've been bad at pronouncing names correctly. Uh, (laughs) Designer of the forthcoming Tiny Towns from AEG, which I got to play at PAX Unplugged and very much enjoyed, so I'm very glad to have him on the podcast. Thanks for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. So this is your going to be your first officially published game, right, Tiny Towns? Yes, this is this is my first game, which is mind blowing. It's been a, a crazy process. So I I pitched it at PAX Unplugged 2017, which was actually my first game convention ever, and the fact that I got to see my game in the cardboard one year later at the same convention was fantastic. Yeah, when I was talking to, I forget her name, but one of the people at EEG after I played it, she mentioned that they specifically try to get a very quick turnaround on it, which showed to me their enthusiasm for the game, which is has got to feel great. Yeah, it's it's awesome. I mean, they really hit the ground running right away. We got into development and everything back in March or so. So, and, you know, it's just been a, a whirlwind of, of playtesting and, and iterating and whatnot since then. So it's been awesome. awesome. Yeah, it's great. Is this the first game you've seriously pitched to a publisher? Yeah, this was number one, so I got incredibly lucky. I can't recommend my methods to <laughs> to others because I have no idea how, how reliable they are. But yes, I, I got really lucky, I think, pitching, pitching to AEG, who has done such a phenomenal job with every aspect of the game, I think. Before we get more into the game, I want to get into that later, but I, in these interviews, these discussions, I like to get into more the the person themselves kind of figure out how where they came from as a designer so what got you initially into modern board games where did that begin for you so my family has always played games at at every family gathering i'm actually at visiting family right now we just got done playing some sequence one of our favorites so we've always played games i grew up playing anything from risk and monopoly to acquire and then it was in high school that we found a box of Carcassonne in the basement, my friends and I. I was in 11th grade or so. Mm-hmm. And so we we cracked that open, and that was really when I entered the world of modern board games. And we were like, oh my gosh, the board is different every time. This is phenomenal. <laughs> and Catan followed shortly after that, and Dominion and Seven Wonders. So And then lots lots and lots of discovering games through, through college. You're the first person who, where Carcassonne was actually the the kind of introductory game people have mentioned it before and like the list of games they played at first, but I'm very glad to see that someone uh, Carcassonne was the one that opened their eyes. That's great. Yep. Yep. That was the first one. You know, Catan also holds a very special place in my heart, of course, mm-hmm. but Car- Carcassonne was the one we obsessed over and bought a bunch of expansions for initially. Yeah. Honestly, between the two, that's the one I would recommend to people first. Now is, is Carcassonne over Catan. Yes. I would agree with that. Yeah. Yeah, because I played Catan first, but it wasn't as exciting for me, and the Dominion got me hooked. Uh, Mm -hmm. Only later I found Carcassonne. I was like, wow, I didn't realize what I was missing. Yep, much less punishing, I think, for new players than than Catan. You can have a you can have a bad game, your first game of Catan for sure. Yeah, that's true. If there's there's more luck there, well, the the luck in Carcassonne is a bit more subtle. Yes. Yep. Um, And at various points throughout the game, you're always going to be kind of helping other people, either, you know, inadvertently, just the way the map gets played. So I, I feel like it's a bit more friendly in that regard. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you start playing all these great games. Uh, at what point do you start designing games? I would say beginning of college, I started having inklings of game ideas that turn into pages of notes and uh, no prototypes, of course, just notes and notes and notes. Um, so it took me a long time to start actually making prototypes that I could play. And I don't think any of them survived more than four or five plays before I shelved them until Tiny Towns. Tiny Towns was the first one I really played a lot. So I, I think I got pretty lucky with the initial idea. It was definitely a game where the idea came first other than a, a theme. But yeah, that was my first game that I really prototyped and iterated extensively. And how long did that process take before you started pitching it? Before I started pitching it was about a year and a half, I would say. Okay. Thereabouts. So not an incredibly long time. 
Yeah, that, that's pretty quick. I mean, it, it isn't the most complicated game in the world either. either right. Or, you know, midlife mm-hmm. family style. Yeah, and a lot of a lot of what existed in that very first prototype survived to the final version. Like I, I decided when I made the first prototype, it's going to be a four by four grid. That seems like a good size, and there will be seven buildings that you can make. That seems like a good number, and it's amazing that those numbers actually turned out to be kind of right, or so we have felt through playtesting. Yeah, with some things you can kind of get the the feeling of it, I suppose. I've heard that before where people are like, yeah, we just we chose this because it felt right and then we never found a reason to change it. Right. What are you enjoying now? What kind of games uh are you still playing lots of Carcassonne, lots of those games that got you into the hobby? Have you moved on to heavier games as I have uh mostly? Is it just Tiny Towns 24/7? It's it's basically just Tiny Towns. Yeah, of course. No, uh, I do play a lot of Tiny Towns still. Um, I actually played Carcassonne about two times in the past couple months. So it had been, you know, on the shelf for a long time and then we brought it out. So I enjoy quite a range of games from from really light to fairly complex. I would say Agricola and Castles of Burgundy and Roll for the Galaxy are my upper complexity area. But then I play lots of games like The Mind I've been getting really into lately and uh, Kokoro Avenue of the Kadama I play quite a lot. Patchwork is a, a favorite of mine. So I do really like those 20 to 30 minute simple mechanisms but difficult choices games. So that's really my, my favorite area of gaming, nice. I would say. Nice. And I can't let someone mention The Mind and, and let that go. Is, is that a game that you kind of it, it latched on to immediately as started as the first time you played it and you're like, wow, this is something really unique and novel? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, of course, saw all the buzz about it long before I was able to get a hang, you know, get a hold of it. Um, and I'd heard it was a game where the magic sort of works for a group or it doesn't. But as soon as I played the first game, I was like, yep, I'm hooked by the magic for sure. And I haven't shown it to anyone who didn't feel the same way. Everyone gets the yeah. simplicity and difficulty of that puzzle it's i think it's such a blast such a clever design and definitely a game <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> i I, yep. I find myself kind of in the middle of the great the mind debates because i think it's all right but i also okay. think it's definitely a game i think people criticize it because it's like selling itself as like magic woo woo stuff aren't getting the point but i also don't love the game so I always like to test out people's reactions to it. Uh Uh-huh. Sounds like you caught the initial buzz where I don't remember what con that was where it came out and everyone was talking about it and not the the backlash buzz. I think I got it shortly after the backlash. Oh, did you? Yeah. Yes. So that was when the debates were going on. It was hard to find people saying it wasn't a game, but I knew the argument existed. and, And so I read the rules and I was like... Oh, I I just read a rule book. There are objectives there, and there are rules condition. you can break. So yes, yeah, <laughs> there are rules. There's a loss condition. There's a win condition. It seems like it came to me. Yeah. Although I hunted and I couldn't find anyone, at least on BGG, that I could find actually making an argument that it's not a game. Exactly. Yeah, I had trouble it's finding. Not a game. But when when yeah. press, they were like, "Well, it doesn't feel like a game." <laughs> like, all right, that's not yeah. really an argument. Anyways, that's my mind, the mind tangent. Back to Tiny Towns. So you said the the concept of building something came first before even the town theme? Yes. I think in my notebook, I, I wrote down that it's a game where you're building something. It could be anything. <laughs> yeah. um, and that, you know, Towns was on that, that list initially. And I had actually had other designs prior. I was trying to make a town building game. I've been trying to make a good town building game for years. And this was the first one where I applied that and it really came together. It's always been about building something for sure, though. Did the Tetris shapes kind of thing, was that there early on? Was that kind of the initial impetus or was it just Um, building something? The Tetris shapes were pretty early. I wasn't sure if the resources were going to go like around the space where the thing appears. And then I ultimately decided to do Tetris shapes. Um, yeah, so it was Tetris shapes in the first prototype that I I tested. And the building can go in any one of the spaces where the resources were. So yeah, th- those rules were there in the first, the first iteration. I guess for people who missed, was it our previous podcast? 
two podcasts ago I talked about it. But if you wouldn't mind giving a short explanation for people who missed that podcast and haven't heard of the game, just kind of to give us some basis for what we're talking about. What, what is Tiny Towns? Sure. So in Tiny Towns, each player is the mayor of their own tiny town, represented by a 4 by 4 grid. And you are going to be filling your grid with resources that you turn into buildings for little forest creatures to live in. So you're making these buildings by arranging resources in very specific sort of Tetris-like shapes. And once you have completed one of the building layouts, you tell everyone, I am making a cottage or I am making a farm. And then you remo- remove the resources and put the building piece down in any one of the empty spaces where those resources were. But because you can only have one resource or one building per space, your board gets really crowded as you work on multiple things at once. And then as you finish them, you have some room to breathe again. And the way you get these resources is each player takes turns being the master builder who names one of the five resources which everyone has to place on their board. So at the end of the game, everyone has dealt with the same exact resources. And you build until your town totally fills up with buildings or resources, and then you score points. Each building scores based on adjacency or how many different buildings you have. And there's seven buildings per game, and those will change from round to round. So there's there's four copies of six of the seven buildings that rotate out. So that is Tiny Towns. I feel like you've given that speech before. I have a few times. <laughs> yeah, I saw you uh, demoing it at PAX. I think the one game I jumped in, you were like on a break and someone else demoed it. But uh, I saw you at the table there for a while. Yep. Yep. Uh, I was there for, for quite a while. It was a blast. I could have done it. I could have done it the whole time nonstop. When someone came to relieve me from my shift, I was like, oh, really? Is it that time? Okay. <laughs> that's, that's great. That's the first time I've ever heard anyone say that about working at a con. <laughs> <laughs> it helped that I was like just chugging water and lozenges the whole time, so I didn't lose my voice. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, losing your voice would have been would have been difficult. So you start with this concept for the game. You have the idea of building up. You have a grid. You have the Tetris shapes. Was there any point where you hit a roadblock or where you had to really overcome something in the design, or did it all come together pretty smoothly? <laughs> I really got lucky with every aspect of this game. I think it came together pretty smoothly. I would say the the biggest roadblock was when I was, it was after I was at PAX Unplugged 2017. So I, I had pitched AG and I felt that it went well. And I had played Tiny Towns 20 times at least that weekend. And I was in the unpub room and I was getting tired of it. And I was like, okay, that's not, that's not an acceptable thing. Why am I getting tired of this? I need to double the number of buildings in the game, which will multiply the number of setups by like 10,000 or something like that. So I I worked on coming up with more buildings and then I added monuments into the game. So originally they were just, these are the seven buildings that are available, sort of Dominion style. Every player has access to these. You can build multiple of them and that's it. There's nothing secret. I added monuments, which are private buildings. So you're dealt a monument card. Um, And I believe this was not being shown at the demo uh, at PAX Unplugged most of the time. So your monument is a private building. Only you have the ability to make, and you can only build it once. And if you do, it's going to give you a new way to score points or a new ability you can use or a one-time effect. Uh, So it just sets everyone off in a different direction. So there's 15 monuments in the game, and I think that added the right amount of variety. Okay, so it was just iterating and adding more variety to the game. That was kind of the what you had to do to get it to where you wanted it. Yep, pretty much. And Monuments is it's sort of a, a modular part of the game. I recommend playing it your first time, but you can take it out if you want a simpler game and you shouldn't find anything missing. But even people who aren't really intense gamers, I think, won't find it really complex. And you said there are four copies or four different types of each building? Yes. So there, there's seven buildings. One of them doesn't change. That's the cottage. And then the other six, there's four cards for each. So each one is going to have slightly different resources needed to build it. So you never know what the resource distribution will be in that game. And they score points and interact differently. Some of them grant abilities. So that initial setup is always going to be a little bit different. Can that just be random? Are the recommended setups uh, or any specific buildings not allowed to go together? It's random, so there's nothing you can't combine. There are some situations where, you know, oh, these two really pair nicely, but everyone has access to them, so it's never unfair or anything like that. I know you said the the convention kind of flew by and it was really nice for you. Did I assume the reactions from people were, were really great who, who demoed it? Uh, yeah, reactions, reactions were great, which was... 
it, it's a really cool moment just to see my game existing and then to show it to people and see them react positively was was really cool. So there were little kids playing it a lot younger than I might recommend playing it. I think some of the kids were seven or eight years old um, and watching them understand the concept sometimes better than their parents was really satisfying. I never intended for it to be, you know, a younger kid's game, but the fact that they were able to to play that was was really cool. And uh, Quinn's from Shut Up and Sit Down came by and played. And that was also a really cool moment for me. I've been watching Quinn's and Shut Up and Sit Down and that whole crew for years. So having him play my game in front of me was an amazing moment. Yeah, I saw him. I saw him sitting there playing that. I, I listened to some of his comments afterwards, and he he seemed to really like it. Yes, yeah, he did, which is which is pretty cool. I, I can imagine that would be <laughs> awesome. You're the first person I think I've interviewed where it's your first game, and you are not self publishing. Was that something that you deliberately decided not to do? Very much so. Yep i I'm not really interested in the running a business aspect of of a Kickstarter, which from my understanding is what running a Kickstarter is. You have to deal with distribution and fulfillment and and marketing and email lists. And uh, I I enjoyed pitching a lot. I like the aspect of creating a sell sheet for my game, figuring out which publishers to target, what what hole does this fill in the market. Um, I like that business aspect, but after that, I just want to make games. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I absolutely wanted to find a publisher who would do all the hard work for me. And I was lucky enough to find one that kept me really in the loop. And I remember uh, AEG telling me that early on that I would be very involved in the creative process. Uh, so if there wasn't a decision made that I wasn't uh, a part of or aware of through the whole development process, which was which was really great. So it was a lot of working closely with Josh Wood, who's the developer. He also is the designer of Cat Lady. So, and it's just the two of us over Skype, throwing ideas around, working in you know Google Docs to generate as many building ideas as we could, and play testing over Skype because you can actually play Tiny Towns over Skype pretty easily. So I was totally in the loop, and it was a blast. Was AEG the first publisher you pitched to, or did you like pitch to a number of them at that PAX, and then they were the most interested? How did that work? I pitched to five publishers while I was there. And not only were they my my number one choice, but they were also the most interested and they liked the game the most as it was, which was cool. I was very prepared to have to make changes to the game. I remember telling a lot of the publishers I pitched to, these wooden meeple buildings, I had ordered some wooden building meeples from Spiel Material, a game part site. Um, I said, I, I realize this would be pretty expensive to produce all these wooden buildings, so these might turn into tiles or something like that. And I, I said that to AEG and John Zinser, I think it was, was like, oh, we love the the wooden building meeples. These would definitely stay in the game. And that was that was cool to hear because I love that it's if you walk past the table and see people playing this game, you look and you're like, it looks like they're building towns. And that's exactly what's going on. Yeah, yeah. And then they see the, the name of the game on the box. You're like, oh, it all makes sense now. Yeah, tiny towns. That's that's what it is. A building <laughs> game about building buildings. It's all very straightforward and clear. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. I always like to hear about that process, especially from someone who, you know, it, it's your first published game. Did you, I assume you, you did a lot of research into that process of pitching, finding a publisher, what to expect beforehand? Yep. I did a, a decent amount of uh, reading through guides on how to make a good sell sheet and how to approach a publisher. I probably emailed more publishers than I should have. I should have been a little pickier and wasted less of their time and my time. But yeah, and I basically learned that you should figure out what a publisher's preferred method of approaching them is and follow that to a T. Some publishers want you to do a, a video presentation or they want to see some video footage of the game. Others want like proof of blind playtesting in one form or another. So yes, yeah, I did a, a decent amount of research and I, I felt pretty prepared when I was there. I didn't get a ton of surprises, which was a nice feeling. That's good. Yeah. Uh, how much playtesting... And this is something I'm asking purely out of out of ignorance for, and I suppose it changes based on the publisher. But what would you say in terms of like the ratio of the amount of playtesting you did before signing on with AG and after? Like, how much does it really I, ramp up during the development process? Yes, i I was playing quite a lot before I I pitched. I was playing as much as I could. You can play it two players, so I played with my girlfriend a lot, who was one of the main play testers. But I did blind play testing beforehand. But after it was signed, was when I really started doing 
a ton of play testing. So probably, you know, at this point, two thirds of my total plays or more were after signing the game and in the development process. And was that, I assume you worked on that in conjunction with AEG, you know, establishing some kind of system for blind play testing and, and getting data and all that? Well, the blind play testing I did before was, you know, was me finding people willing to play my game in front of a camera or, or while I was sitting there being uh, very silent, trying very hard to be silent. Um, and then AEG's blind play testing and play testing was all handled on their end, aside, of course, from the play tests that we did over Skype and whatnot. So, gotcha. um, yeah, they've got their own play testing setup they do over there. And then I was playing as much as I could with friends and strangers and whoever else was willing during the development process. During the blind play test you did, were you actually able to stay silent? I think I did a pretty good job. Yeah. Um, I think, I think the only time I broke my silence was when someone pointed out that, so the original cottage buildings were green, but on the cottage card, the meeple icon was orange. And someone pointed that out and they're like, well, this is orange and this piece is green. I assume that means this. And I was like, wait, that's orange. I'm colorblind. So oh. I, <laughs> so I learned these things, but that hadn't been pointed out to me in the year and a half or so of playing before that. So my mind was sort of, was sort of blown, but yes, I was able to stay silent during that particular play test. And then there were others that were done in front of a video, you know, it was, it was filmed and I wasn't there and they just had the rules. So I was entirely silent. That's good. I think I've been yeah. a participant in three blind play tests now and none of the designers have been able to stay silent. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Well, there's disagreement over what constitutes a blind play test, whether the designer should be entirely not present and there should be a camera or whether them being in the room, not saying anything counts. In my opinion, they're both blind play tests. Yeah. They're just different degrees of it. And I think you probably will get a somewhat different response from the group. If the person whose game you're playing is sitting there in the room with you, surely your responses to some things will be somewhat affected by that. With the final production copy, I'm I'm interested since you are colorblind, is it has it been adapted to be colorblind friendly? Yes. Uh, and there were a couple moments when I was like, hey, Josh, is this brown? Because I'm not sure. And we had to go through and, and change the colors and make sure everything looked right. But there's different degrees of colorblindness and different types of colorblindness. So I'm red, green, colorblind. And that's the most uh, common one, right? It's it's a very common one. Yeah, okay. especially among men. So it it works for me. I haven't encountered anyone else who's had any issues with it. The colors are, are very bold and distinct and all the buildings have the shapes to go along with them. So it's difficult to, to mix up the buildings as well. But yes, I, I give it my colorblind approval. <laughs> Great. Was that something that you had to kind of point out to them or were they already working under the assumption they were going to make sure it's colorblind friendly? Yeah, they were, they were working under that assumption. And I, I learned during the development process that there's not really a, there's no real way to test. It's not like you can submit your colors to some algorithm that tells you this might be an issue for this type of colorblindness. You just have to put it in front of colorblind people. Mm. But being being a group sometimes affected by board games and their lack of colorblind friendly, friendliness, I made sure that was not going to be an issue whatsoever. Uh, yeah, so. that's great. Yeah, because I know, uh, have you heard of uh, Meeple Like Us? Yes. Uh, yep. Yeah, uh, I've talked with uh, Michael on a previous podcast. I know he uses a filter thing to kind of test for that because he's not colorblind, but I know there are also tons of nuances involved, and also just something as simple as the lighting of the room. I know can affect things. Yes, and you have to take that into consideration. How good is the lighting these people are playing in? So, in terms of tiny towns, what are you doing right now? Is it just kind of going around doing interviews like this? waiting for the release in terms of the production you're just waiting for the shipments to arrive right yes yep pretty much um and yep i'm doing lots of podcast interviews which it's been my first time i've ever been on a podcast so it's been really fun and uh, i'm still playtesting as always i am working on expansions which i'm co-designing with josh wood the developer um nothing is official nothing's guaranteed whatsoever but uh we have lots of expansion ideas that we're very excited for I mean, my impression coming out of PAX after playtesting, it was like, okay, this one's this one's going to do well. Like my relatively young opinion or relatively young perspective in the board game world. But I'm like, okay, it hits, it's colorful. It's got a good publisher behind it. It's family friendly, but it appeals to people like me. I think it's 
I think it's going to do pretty well. So I'm excited to hear that there are already expansion ideas in the works. And it seems like AEG is pushing it pretty well. I mean, it was kind of a feature table at PAX, you know, running a, a big demo there. And uh, I, I wish I could remember the name of the, the woman I spoke to from AEG. Uh, it may have been Mara. It might have been. Uh, mm-hmm. Mar- yep, she's a director of marketing. Yes, that's her. Yeah. She seemed very excited about it as well. So that's got to feel wonderful. Yeah, it does. They, uh, it feels like they're, they're treating me very specially, which is nice. And they're very excited about this game. And, uh, thank you, by the way, that you think it's, it's going to do well. I certainly, I hope it does. And it's been cool hearing people say that. So, and just awesome to have a company this excited for a game that they finished it within a year is absolutely surreal to me. So I'm, Counting down until until April. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's still on a, on track for April. That's what I was told at, at PAX. So it, that was the expected release. Yep. As far as I know, April twenty sixth is the release date, and they're planning to do a a retail release for some retail stores a couple weeks earlier than that. So some okay. friendly local game stores may have it before then. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that's a good way to to help out the local stores. Yep. Absolutely. And then hopefully we'll see some expansions after that. Are you working on anything else, any other designs, or is it just kind of all Tiny Towns expansion fiddling at this point? Tiny Towns is dominating my game design, but I do have two other games I've been working on for a while now. Um, One of them is Artistes, which is a party drawing game where you don't necessarily want to draw too well. So everyone is a pretentious artiste who seeks to be misunderstood. And you are creating a drawing of a, a very basic English noun that you want to ideally get exactly one of the critics to guess correctly. Everyone is drawing at the same time. So everyone does their drawing and then everyone takes the role of a critic while they guess everyone's drawings at the same time. And as a critic, you don't care about being right. You just want to understand the now of the moment. Uh, so you want to write the most popular answer among other players to get the most points. So it's a, a weird backward sort of balance in in both roles and it's very silly and fun and the other one is pedal pushers which is a a game of running competing flower shops trying to make the most profit and it's a a light engine building game where everyone's engines feed into each other because as you plant flowers in your garden they're going to pollinate your garden and other players gardens on your turn so you are set collecting to make bouquets and you're selling single stems as the market fluctuates their values and just a light a light little engine building game. That's interesting. I, I noticed all three, you know, those two you just spoke about and Tiny Towns all have, and maybe this is just accidental, but kind of a running theme of like a little bit more player interaction than you would think. So in Tiny Towns, you have the fact that someone picks the color. Everyone has to use that color. I guess the party, a party game would always have interaction, but the, the pollination thing reminded me of that Tiny Towns dynamic. Uh, is that something you, you consciously try to include in your games? I would say so. I I do enjoy games that are sort of solitaire puzzles, like Roll for the Galaxy is one of my favorites. It's very low interaction, but it's a very satisfying puzzle. But I also like games where you're interacting with each other and maybe there's some, some table talk. So I, I like to try to incorporate interaction in my games if possible. I'm sure people will think Tiny Towns is a more solitaire like game but it can be very interactive and sometimes there even is table talk like i'll say red if you promise to say yellow and you know there's mm-hmm. there's no rules against against making promises that may or may not be kept so i, I think i did that in my demo actually oh cool yeah uh, it's, it's cool when players do that unprompted and, and and they chose the color that i specifically did not want so i should have kept my mouth shut yep that that'll happen but I, you know, in tiny towns with two players, uh, that's much more of an issue, right? Blocking be- in a two-player game, blocking usually becomes as advantageous as gaining. So you can have a lot more purposeful screwing over of another person in the two-player. Yes, the two-player game it's it's different uh, from the other ones for sure. Especially like a six-player game, which is just chaos. Blocks are just raining down on your board, and you're trying to yeah. <laughs> make whatever you can out of the insanity. And then in a two-player game, it is very calculated and sometimes you don't build the thing that scores you the most points you build the thing that uses a really unfortunate combination of resources as you watch your opponent try to dig themselves out of that so yeah it's a little more i guess chess like in some ways yeah because that's an interesting thing because i noticed when i was looking through the components because you know for the demo they had a particular set of seven buildings there were you know that were out 
for the demo, but I looked at a couple of the other ones and the colors of the blocks required changed. So in, in Tiny Town seems like kind of a, it is a very large strategic component of like, okay, I need to go for these buildings or, or I want to try to go for this combination of buildings and you try to do that from the start. But manipulating the colors that come out could be kind of an extra layer of strategy onto that. Yeah, I, I think those are the two layers. Of course, you need to have a way you're reasonably going to get a lot of points. But if you're the last player in, you get to keep on naming whatever resources you want, which can be a really massive advantage. So if you can edge the other players out and force them to finish their towns early, that can be really, uh, really useful. So sometimes looking at a setup and identifying the worst resource, the most awkward resource is handy. And every resource appears on every version of at least two different buildings. So you're always going to have a choice when someone says blue. It's not going to you know, funnel you into exactly one building, but it can still be a really awkward resource sometimes. Mm-hmm. That's really cool. Now I want to play Tiny Towns. Uh, <laughs> with with the other two designs you're working on, uh, at what stage are those at? Are you getting ready to try to pitch those? I'm Yeah, I'm getting ready with those. Uh, Artistes is pretty simple as far as its mechanics go. There's not much to it. I've been tinkering with the score system, and now I'm just trying to make a prototype that looks cool. My prototypes are on index cards for the longest time. I always try to make them very ugly so I can pull things out quickly without feeling like I'm, you know, yeah, destroying something I worked hard on. So I'm making uh, sort of frames, like gilded frames for artists that you slip your sheet of paper into so that when you prop up your your masterpiece, which always looks like nonsense, it's in a a gilded frame. And then pedal pushers is I'm still tinkering with a couple of the the balance of the engine building, it tends to snowball and I'm trying to, to find a way to work with that. But I hope both of those will be approaching pitch ready level sometime soon. That's fantastic. Talk I think I've exhausted all my thoughts and questions. Uh, <laughs> it was it was a pleasure speaking to you and uh, glad you had such a great process in getting this game published. That, that's Thank you. you know, it's, I think it's a fairly rare thing and it's, it seems like it went it, to a deserving game. It is. Yeah. It, it, the more I learn, the more I realize just how lucky I got. So um, thank you for your your well wishes and for having me on. Great. Well, uh, thanks for listening, everybody. Don't forget to go to thethoughtfulgamework.com. Check me out on social media, on Twitter and on Facebook. Don't forget to rate and review this podcast on iTunes or wherever you get podcasts. And if you'd like to be part of the crowd listening and watching to our podcast being recorded live, get on our Discord group and all kinds of other fun prizes, go to patreon.com slash thethoughtfulgamer. We appreciate any contributions you can make there. Uh, Thanks again, Peter, and good luck with Tiny Towns. You said April 26th? Yep, that's right. Awesome. And at some game stores a couple weeks before then, I look forward to uh, playing it again. It was a really fun demo. Thanks again for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's been fun. All right. We'll talk to you all again soon. Thanks.